Hello, and um, thank you for, for joining me. Um, this is part of a series of interviews I'm doing to help people take back control of their fertility journey in their life as well. So what I wanted to do is speak to people who are doing a great job in the fertility industry to raise awareness and support for people in different parts of their journey and building their different families in different ways. Uh, so today I'm speaking to Mike from Two Dads. So hi and thank you for chatting hi, to me. It's all right. I will briefly explain who you are, but then you will do a much better job of it than I will explaining <laughs> that um, Mike and his husband, Wes, are on a mission to raise awareness of same-sex parenting and also normalise modern families and also increase and improve the information and support that's shared around surrogacy as well. So whether you're in a same-sex couple or um, a heterosexual couple who are needing, who have been through their fertility journey and are now wanting to look at surrogacy. So does that explain it well enough? Do you want to? It explain? does. No, that's 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 a perfect explanation <laughs> and introduction. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, we uh, so so two dads UK is essentially what you've just said. We are what we started life out as a an Instagram and a Facebook page, which was tracking our fertility journey uh, and us becoming dads through surrogacy through UK surrogacy. Um, we've got two children together, um, Tallulah's three and Duke was, was one yesterday. So um, we, we have, uh, we, we're, we're blessed and fortunate to have two children um, through surrogacy, but through our page and now through our website and through all the other work that we do, we, um, we want to do several things really. One is to sort of destigmatize surrogacy and to, to, to highlight how accessible it can be. Yeah. But also in doing that, supporting others that are on a, a particular fertility journey, whether whether you're heterosexual or whether you're gay, um, it's just about sort of highlighting um, how to approach surrogacy in the UK. Yeah, and we'll come on to it um, in a little bit, but there's very, I know when we've spoken before, there's very different emotions going into that if you are a same-sex couple going into surrogacy around the excitement of that. And then if you're a heterosexual couple who have maybe been through rounds of IVF and surrogacy is your next step, there's a lot of different emotions around that, isn't there? And that, that will come into play and need Absolutely. to be um, taken into account by people who are helping those with surrogacy. Totally, yeah, for sure. It's it, they're, they're they're very they're very different because we're at very different ends of the journey. For some, it's starting, and particularly for for gay men, it's it's that first step and first start into to building and creating a family. Um, and then for 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 those that have been struggling with their fertility, it surrogacy tends to be one of the last options really um so yeah the emotions involved are very very different versus um a, a gay man or a gay couple versus a, a heterosexual couple going through the journey it's, it can be very different yeah and um i'll ask you about that in a little bit just in terms of the support and things but just to start off at what point did you and where make the decision that you wanted to become daddies and how did you you start that process we um we met in in 2012 in june 2012 and um it was birmingham pride and i was out with my mates and i just wanted to go out have a few drinks not wanting to meet anyone i'd just come out of a long-term relationship anyway i bumped into to wes and uh, you know we instantly hit it off and um over the course of us getting to know one another i you know wes already had at that point a seven-year-old um from a previous straight relationship so i knew who's already a dad um and i approached the topic of wanting children i've always wanted to be a parent um i didn't know how that would look but i you know, from about sort of 18 19 i knew that becoming a parent was something that i yearned to to have and um didn't know anyone that was gay and a parent back when I first came out when I was 22. Yeah. Uh, and I met Wes when I was sort of 36. Um, but we had that conversation quite early about me wanting to be a parent and Wes was open to having more children. Yeah. Um, we spoke about all the varying options available to us, whether that was adoption or fostering or, 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 or surrogacy. And for me, surrogacy was um, always the preferred option. Yeah. Um, and that's not to say I'm 
and tea, all of the other options. But for, for that, that was my that was my my preference. Yeah. Um, so we we started back in 2014. Um, we then so it's 2013. We started then exploring surrogacy and what that looked like. So we looked at all of the varying international options of which there's tons. You know, and we spent a good three years researching surrogacy. Um, so we looked at all of the, the the countries that some of them don't exist any longer for um, international surrogacy uh, or certainly for LGBTQ um, intended parents. So we looked at the likes of India and Thailand and Cambodia and we looked at the US, we looked at Canada, we looked at Mexico, we looked at um, the Ukraine, we looked at Cyprus. But none of those really felt right to us um, for lots of reasons. They're, they're very, they were very quickly, we were discovering that some of these countries weren't particularly safe or necessarily very ethical. Um, and, you know, the welfare of, of the surrogate, the egg donor, and ultimately the child is what's so important in this journey. Um, and any exploitation of any of those component, components just does not fit well with us. Yeah. And, and then there were, there were, then there was surrogacy, uh, routes to surrogacy, which were, you know, likes of the U S and Canada, which are super, super ethical. Um, but just, we couldn't afford them. Um, you know, you're talking sometimes in upwards of a hundred, 150, 160, 170,000 pounds to complete that type of journey. And that's just not money we, we had. Mm. Um, and then we came back to the UK and the UK, um, for many people don't understand that, you know, UK surrogacy is completely legal. Yeah. It, it's, it's altruistic, which means that it's not commercial. So any type of surrogacy that takes place in the UK is done through surrogates being reimbursed reasonable expenses to, to carry your child. So we, we looked at all the varying options. Then we, we decided that the UK was the option for, for us. Yeah. And how did you find that process? I mean, I completely understand that. And I'd say that the resounding thing at that is do you research? You know, if, if surrogacy is, is something that's an option that you're considering, then it's really important to do your research on what is right for you and researching all the different options thoroughly. Mm -hmm. um, how, once you'd made that decision around going for surrogacy in the UK, how did you find the process of that and the support around that as well? We once we decided on, on UK surrogacy, what we what we did next was um, we looked at the the not for profits or the charities that were in existence back in sort of 2014. We looked at those organisations, and you know you had some organisations like Surrogacy UK, Brilliant Beginnings, um, Cots, National Fertility Society. Um, but none of them at that particular moment in time were allowing intended parents to register because there was a massive shortage of surrogates and an overwhelming demand for their services. So um, all of their books were closed essentially. Um, and we they then decided to do what's known as the independent route. So the independent route means you do your own research, you would you know, source and find your own legal advice, you would find your own clinic, you would essentially network and find your own surrogate uh, and, there, and then an egg donor if you were doing gestational surrogacy, which we were. Um, so that then started a whole other element of, of, of research and, and we absorbed ourselves massively into um, looking at all of the online forums. So there's a number of really good quality Facebook closed groups. Yeah. There were a number of other websites that offered support into what surrogacy looked like. And we, we just started doing our research and um, we, we wrote a profile about ourselves, about you know, that we wanted to become dads through surrogacy. You have to be very careful because you know the laws are still very strict with what you can and what you can't say. Right. Um, so you can't advertise for a surrogate in the UK. That's illegal. Um, right. 
you can't obviously pay or profit from surrogacy in the UK. That's illegal. Um, you can't actively recruit surrogates in the UK. That's also illegal. So you have to be so careful with what you can and what you can't do and say. If you can't advertise or ask for one, how would you find one for anybody who's in the same position as you and thinking that actually the, the route for them is going down the independent route? How would you go about that to <laughs> avoid the least? Well, yeah, well, what you would do is that you look at, you look at the, the groups that, that exist currently. So, for example, if you look at some of the Facebook groups, that there's a couple that are really, really good. Um, you use the Facebook group as a network. So what you would do, you would introduce yourself within a particular forum and you would state that you're intended parents, that you know you have dreams of becoming dads or parents through surrogacy. You live here, you uh, are looking to talk to other surrogates and intended parents to, to learn more about surrogacy. And that's how it starts. It's, it's, it's essentially friendship first. And that's for, for the majority of surrogacy getting to knows is, is the term that's used um the, that get to know period is, is done through building friendships first because having that solid friendship foundation is so important with surrogacy because when surrogacy occasionally goes wrong it's usually because that that relationship or that friendship has broken down oh. yeah so you'd you'd gone onto the forums and you'd started talking about that how did you find the process once you'd found some are you comfortable to share to yeah, share of course that? so um the the forums are really interesting and uh a number of the the other not-for-profits also work in a in a get to know um sort of environment as well so whether it's like surrogacy uk for example they they encourage social events where surrogates and any parents will meet and you all network that way whereas when you're online you just do it all virtually and then you agree to meet so you i think you can only describe it as it's it's it can sometimes feel a bit like dating because you're having these multiple conversations with people you're telling them about your story your background your life your your, your desires and you then have messages from from uh, potential surrogates that that want to help you achieve those goals. So when you first get those messages, they're firstly that you're really excited because you know <laughs> someone's talking to you, and you know you get that butterfly moment in your stomach, and you're like, oh, this person could make all our dreams come true. And then another another surrogate may message you, and then you you're like, ah. Oh, oh my gosh, I feel like I'm really being unfaithful to the first one that messaged me. Shall I tell her that someone else has messaged me? And you just get into this, like, yeah. I don't know, you get this guilt to, to a degree. Um, so it's really, it's a really interesting um, period. And, and mainly because there's so much riding on this relationship and this friendship building that you, you put your, your heart and your soul into it. And, and that, being in the groups whether you do it through a not-for-profit or whether you do it independently um it, it's intense you know no one goes into surrogacy thinking that um oh brilliant in two months time i'll meet a surrogate i'll have a baby in 10 months time you know no one thinks that because this is this is a a an intense period it's an emotional journey it's often a, a journey that that is two two and a half years long it's not something that happens um happens quickly it's something that you do have to invest your time into um but when it happens it's just you know it's it's the most beautiful friendship that you will ever form and um we were messaged by our surrogate caroline um and we first of all we, we chatted uh, and we then met for coffee and we met her and her husband because she was married she'd never been a surrogate before uh she had four of the children and she wanted to specifically do this for a gay couple um and we just instantly clicked you know we just knew that this incredible human being was someone that was going to be in our life 
um, and help us achieve what we wanted to do. We, we just knew that instantly. So we took about six months building that friendship. You know, we, we took about six months getting to know, meeting her children, introducing Katie, where's his daughter to, to her kids. Uh, and then we were like, yeah, okay, let's, let's go let's talk to a clinic. Let's all go. And all four of us went to Care Fertility in Manchester. Yeah. Um, and we chose that particular clinic because they had a, a good surrogacy program. Um, and they were experienced with dealing with uh, gay surrogacy. Um, and then, then the journey began, essentially. And from that point then, did you find the process quite straightforward? Obviously, the building relationships were really important and took a lot of time you know, to build up those relationships and make those decisions. Once you'd started on the process, was it fairly, you know, fairly easy process to go through? Yeah, it, it is really. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's not, it's certainly not for the faint hearted. It's, it's, you know, it's, there's a lot of paperwork. There's so many you know, varying consents that you have to complete that, that meet the HFEA requirements, obviously the governing body for fertility clinics. Um, there's counselling that you have to go through. You have to have implications counselling. Um, you, and, and that's not only for um, both of the intended parents, regardless of who the donor is, um, but you both will be counselled as with the surrogate and their partner. Um, so that's, it's not intense necessarily, but it's definitely, uh, it, it, it's a, there's a number of processes that you have to go through. Um, it's, there's obviously an expense that comes with surrogacy. You know, it has to be funded privately in, in England and Wales. You know, there, there have been cases in Scotland, but, um, you know, our fertility journey, we had to pay for ourselves, whether that was our surrogate's expenses and, and our cost of our donor eggs, cost of our IVF and the surrogacy treatment. Yeah, um, yeah. So, you know, you have to be prepared for um, eating a lot of beans on toast every night because we were saving like mad <laughs> and we were just about to get married as well. So we were like, oh my gosh, this is, <laughs> this is, this is a commitment. This is what yeah. hopefully children will bring. So this, this yeah. constant expense was something we had to get used to. So. In terms of the process, it was it was relatively straightforward. The clinic were great. And I think one of the things that we like to tell people is, you know, not every fertility clinic is experienced in surrogacy. Yeah. Several may say they do it, but whether they do, you know, hundreds of cycles a year is is another matter. Yeah. So choosing a fertility clinic that's experienced in surrogacy is so important because so many get it wrong. That's it. And I guess even in terms of things like who's allowed to appointments and things like that, if they're experienced in surrogacy, then they'll know that actually it's not just the surrogate, but the intended parents may want to be at the appointments as well. And there's different logistical things around out there that I guess and support mm. levels that are needed to make sure you get what you need. Um, and I know you said there's quite a long process in, in terms of choosing a surrogate. It was the same thing because obviously not everybody would need an egg donor as well, but, but you did. Was the same, a similar process? Yeah. Um, um, no, we, we chose, we wanted an egg donor. And the reason we wanted an egg donor, um, you know, was we wanted that flexibility to, to choose the characteristics of the donor. Um, we also want to create embryos. Um, so that's why gestational surrogacy or host surrogacy was, was for us. The other type of surrogacy is traditional surrogacy, where the surrogate will home inseminate with the intended parents' sperm oh. and um, she would use her eggs. Well, we didn't go down that route. We went down the clinical route. Um, that was just to clarify, really. Um, no, but yeah, ch choosing, choosing an egg donor, we we used the clinic and their donor recruitment um, method. So we were using my sperm first. Um, and if me and Wes could have children naturally, um, we wanted to try and achieve that with creating those embryos. So by doing that, we got them to match Wes's characteristics to a donor. Right. So I'm what would be classed as a brown, brown donor, olive skin, brown eyes, brown hair. Um, and Wes is 
would, would be a blue, a blue blonde donor. So we therefore got them to match uh, us to a blue eye, fair skin, blonde haired donor. Yeah. Um, the opposite of me, essentially. Yeah. So your characteristics, your characteristics and Wes's characteristics then would... Would, would hopefully go into that melting pot and you know let's let's see what that that would bring and uh after about six months they found us the donor that we that we agreed on um and she had donated before to that particular clinic and there had been live births which is how they categorize the success um we were told that she didn't produce many eggs you know she would produce four or five but they would all be viable and that was exactly the case when eggs were retrieved she produced five and four became blastocysts and uh and one we transferred um so yeah the egg donor recruitment um was really interesting it's it's again it was a period of waiting because it's that waiting for them to call you with a with a donor match yeah. which is just you know when you're in the mindset of getting on this journey you just want to get on with it um yeah. But as we all know, fertility treatment isn't like that. It's a lot of it is waiting. Yeah, and I guess it depends how um, specific you are about those characteristics and things. If that's really important to you, so again, it's about like the research and the thinking about what's important to you. And for you, it was important that any child you had had both of your characteristics. And you know, it maybe would have taken slightly longer for that. But if that's what's important to you, then it's it's remember it's worth considering that, isn't it? And remembering that to to ask for that absolutely and you know in the uk there are very limited things that you will be told um you know eye color hair color skin tone height um and obviously a healthy bmi um you know whereas egg donation abroad for example in 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 the states where you know it's donors are screened by education level by their job type by their the class of their degree you know it's like super precise whereas it's not like that here because it's anonymous as well so you know you don't get to see photographs you just know you know the rough characteristics or the non-identifiables of what that donor um, looks like really and that was good enough for us and we we didn't want to be too precise um, but it was important to us that you know a, a potential child would resemble both of us yeah and it's great that you at least have those options um, and you talked about the, the Facebook groups beforehand for support and for learning about the process how did you find the support throughout the process you, you said the clinic you had the, the counseling the implications counseling how have you found support around um, your journey and surrogacy and the egg donation um, I, I, I think it's really lacking um, I think generally the support isn't tailored enough um, and you know I, I think there is sometimes that um, need to counsel someone briefly for a tick box exercise and not really to actually understand you know going into surrogacy can be complex and it can be emotional and and particularly I think for heterosexual couples that are embarking on it because you know they're there will be a, an infertility issue. And I think to have to then explore surrogacy for one party, you're having to give up something. Yeah. And, you know, you're having to, you know, and I think being defeatist is the wrong expression, but to almost have to say to yourself, okay, we, ne we now need to let someone else see if they can help us achieve this. And whether that's just, a host or whether that's a donor as well as a host um, I think more support needs to be tailored around the varying types you know for example being a non-biological parent is massive and there is just not enough support in that space and that's something that we're trying to change you know I'm I'm a biological parent to one of my children and I'm not to the other yeah. and and that's and that comes with and that comes with a little bit of um of uh, i guess 
there, you know, you, you need to look, look after yourself and, and you know, your well-being and, and just the, the way you're, you're prepared emotionally for that. And I wasn't and neither was was my husband and and more needs to be done around that particular space in our in our area. Definitely. And I'd say across the different types of, of counselling support, really, like we talked about earlier. So for for same sex couples who are going through it they're excited there's still there's a lot of the I guess the support and counseling that would be needed just for the process and the understanding there's a different view going into it that you're excited that you're creating a family and this is the way that you need to do it but also like you say the almost helping you cope and it come to getting some acceptance around the fact that maybe you're not the biological parent you know and dealing with any grief that that comes with the grief mm -hmm. for a life that you had imagined and yeah. some acceptance there and then on the other side those who maybe reached the end of the the road for their own IVF journey and having to look at surrogacy as the next option and potentially egg donation as well for them there's a lot of grief there and acceptance that's needed before they can take that step so there's different levels of of support even just within the surrogacy field that would need to be addressed and um, we'll come on to sort of the support you're offering as well because I'd really like you to talk about the support you offer and how you can help people as well. Um, but I think it's really good to acknowledge that there needs to be more support there and where people can find that if they're not getting it at the minute. Mm -hmm. um, so what advice would you give to others who are about to start the process, whether that's making the decisions to start? I know you've talked a lot about already about how, how you made your decisions. Do you have any advice for any part of the process for people who are starting their journey of surrogacy? Yeah, I, I think we touched on it at the beginning and you, you also mentioned it and, and, and it's, it's doing your research. Um, you know, one of the things with surrogacy is that, um, there are a number of sources out there where you can pull information from and there isn't that one central point where you can learn everything and that's why it can often take so long to to navigate your way th through surrogacy because it, it can be quite complex um, but that's not to say that it should be um, discounted at all it's actually really straightforward when you know where to look so by doing your research into the reputable not-for-profits to work with or the best clinics that have a, a proven and an effective surrogacy program and uh, those clinics that have um, you know the shortest waiting lists for eggs potentially or sperm um, so it's understanding really the the surrogacy space so research is key um, I guess the second would be patience because this doesn't happen overnight and you know very often this is this is a two-year journey from that moment you get your head in the game of surrogacy is for us it tends to be a a two-year journey generally um obviously within that nine months of that are, are a pregnancy but if you're working with a fertility clinic and you're new to that particular clinic obviously you know if, you, if, if you're a man you're, you know your sperm has to be quarantined for up to six months um on the start of that journey and then there's finding a donor and then there's also finding a surrogate these are all um components which obviously take time so you know having patience um and and both you and your partner if you're if you're a couple going through this you need to be so aligned because yeah. fertility treatment is stressful enough to not be aligned and to have different views on your donor or different views on the clinic or the types of surrogacy you want to do or or even further down the line and what your, your birthing preparation needs to look like you know you all need to be aligned and that includes your surrogate and their partner if if they have one um so yeah that 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 would be i think my my main my main advice really yeah and like you say, even aligned with your story, you're spending a lot of time with them. That's why it's so important to build that relationship beforehand mm -hmm. around that. And yeah, I think I've definitely, from what you said, the research is, is key, sort of whether that's researching the countries you want to look at and whether you use a not-for-profit company or go independent. There's so many different options that I wasn't aware of um, there, but there's so much information. I guess it's finding reputable information, isn't it? Finding the information from reputable sources. Yeah, it, it's it's exactly that. And, you know, 
when you don't know what you don't know, where do you even start, you know? Um, so that's one of the things that we like to signpost to people. And, you know, admittedly, the name of what we do, you know, to, to Dads UK could allude to the fact that we only help intended fathers. Well, we, you know, we've helped several heterosexual couples that have been on a journey to surrogacy and, and most have now had a child. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're not just, um, exclusive to uh, the LGBTQ community, we we are there to to support anyone that is on a uh, on a quest to parenthood. And if they don't know about surrogacy or they want want to learn more, then um, you know we can help signpost that. And whether that's you know signposting them to a, a, a surrogacy UK or a particular clinic, then that's something that we'll you know we'll do. You know we we. Um, we want to make sure that people are as, as best informed as they possibly can to, in order to meet or get the end goal of uh, having a family. Yeah, I think it is. It's that being informed so you can make informed decisions on what you want to do. Um, I know last time we spoke about um, kind of the, the practical and almost like the legal side of things because you hear a lot in the press or you only ever seem to hear in the press when things have gone wrong. And I know you said before, it's very, very low chance of that happening it's very rare that it does happen but I know it is something that um if you mention surrogacy when you see programs that portray it there's often it often gets portrayed in a bad way and I know when we've spoken so it's so rare are you able to just cover a little yeah. bit about that just to help people that with their understanding of that please yeah absolutely and I think it's really important to also say that you know surrogacy in the UK is underpinned by a law called the surrogacy arrangements act of 1985 okay so since 1985 that's when surrogacy has been has been practicing and has been allowed to, to happen under under that particular legislation now the law is currently being reformed um, and that consultation period ended in October last year so the law commissioners are and will be reviewing all of the responses to that consultation and with a view to towards the end of this year or early next revealing and you know, releasing a paper on what that consultation period um, demonstrated. So the law is about to change or will be changing. Um, but yeah, you know, when surrogacy um when you hear about surrogacy whether that's in you know the gripping dramas on, on on the television or um or some of the films that that depict surrogacy in a twisted and weird way now that's not a true reflection of what surrogacy actually is um you know hundreds three four hundred children a year are born through surrogacy um yet you only hear of those cases that, that go wrong. And you know, in, in over 30 years, I think there've been less than, less than 10 high court cases that, that have um, been, um, that, that have gone to court that have been uh, not the best journey and certainly something which hasn't, certainly didn't end the way it was intended to. Um, so when it goes wrong, um, obviously it's, it, it can be disastrous and it can be unfortunate, but it is very, very rare that that happens. And ultimately, and, and again, going back to the very, very point that we were making, having that really solid relationship with a surrogate and uh, forming that bond, that friendship and getting to know each other um, and having that team mentality uh, is what keeps the, the journey uh, aligned and and safe uh, because unfortunately when things break down it, it's usually down to to parts of that relationship yeah and it's great to know that because I know it, it is a concern for some people so knowing that it's very rare that that happens is another it's almost just helps to to make that decision doesn't it and knowing that it's not a worry that you you need to be thinking about um Agreed. yeah yeah absolutely and, it, and it's it, it's something it's something you need to be aware of but i don't think it's something you need to be worried about you know uh yes there are parts of the law that that are desperate for for being reformed and you know the parental responsibility for one is is the biggest thing for intended parents because when when our children are born they're not legally recognized as um, being uh, legally recognised by the intended parents, you have to go through the parental order process, which you know 
is relatively straightforward, but it's just annoying that, you know, these children are, you know, ours biologically, uh, but we have to go through this parental order process. And hopefully um, the findings that will come out of the, the proposal or the, the consultation will be that that parental responsibility will be granted at birth when the new laws um, are passed. So there is change coming. Uh, it is going to make it far more easier and, and potentially safer. Um, so, yeah, that's, you know, we can't wait for, for the law commissioners to, to unveil what that consultation, consultation period um, discovered. Yeah, which is great, isn't it? it? It is making a change and it's all positive. Um, so would, do you want to just explain how people can find you and the support that you offer and how they can access that? Absolutely. Thank you. Um, so you can find us firstly on social media. So you, we're very active on Instagram and Facebook, not only from a support point of view, but and also, also allowing people into our life as what a two dad family looks like. So there's an element of support through that, but also just a, a, an, an Instagrammable Facebook type approach. So you can find us, which is two dads.u.k, and that's both Facebook and Instagram. So that's T-W-O-D-A-D-S dot U dot K. I'll share the links when I post this as well so that... Yeah, it's quite straightforward. And then we've got a website, which is twodaddies.co.uk. Um, and anyone that wants to get in contact with us can, can use any of those methods too. Uh, and the website's about to be relaunched at the start of September. So that there is a new look and feel coming to the website from the 1st of September. Brilliant. And um, thank you so much. It's so helpful and really insightful as well for, from my point of view to, to understand. Um, is there anything else that you feel is really important for people to consider if they're sort of looking into surrogacy, whether they're a same-sex couple or as a heterosexual couple, considering it? Anything else that you think is important for them to know? Um, I think, again, going just covering off what, what we've said, I think, you know, do do look into the, the varying options available. I think the landscape is changing. Um, and I think, you know, over the course of the next few months, I think the, the surrogacy arena is about to get, um, you know, quite exciting. And I think the levels of support are about to change. So watch this space. Yeah, and that's great. And as always, with anybody who's going anything through anything like this, I always think that support is so important. So if you're struggling, always reach out to somebody. There's always somebody there that will that can help you, that understands. And it's important to not struggle alone going through this. And Absolutely. So thank you so much. That's been great. It's been really helpful. Um, and I'll post the link so that you can get in touch with, with Mike and Wes um, if you need support with that. So thank you. Thank you.